So welcome everyone to the Gen Z Global Forum. We're going to have a great time today talking about Gen Z, led by Gen Z thought leaders uh, with segments featuring their peers. So we're really going to hear from experts today. A few words about the China US Women's Foundation. It was created by Mingyi Yu, Lisa Phillips, and myself in 2017 to be a communications platform for women in China and the US to share ideas, best practices, and friendship in order to help women and their families to thrive. We believe that the power of women working together opens doors for positive change. Our communications platform is enabling great discussions and friendships uh, through challenging times with our weekly Zoom sessions and through forums like this one today. As many of you know, Gen Zers were born between 1995 and 2015. Globally, there are almost 2 billion people in this demographic. They comprise the largest generation ever, comprising nearly 30% of the world's population, including nearly 68 million in, U in the US and 170 million in China. The forum was organized by four Wellesley women, Marisa Mahoney, Rachel Sherberg, Sophie Apfel, and Lusaka Koga. They did a great job and they brought together um, their friends and their uh, understanding of technology, social media to really create four wonderful segments. Um, we're then going to follow with um, a cocktail party, a virtual cocktail party featuring two professors from Wellesley, Mingwei Song and um, he is a professor in Chinese studies, and Quinn Slobodian, um, professor of history and German studies. Um, so welcome everyone, looking forward to spending a really uh, fun time together. And now I'd like to introduce Marisa, who will take it from here. Thank you, Leslie. Um, hello all, my name is Marisa. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm a recent Wellesley College grad and the Red Class of 2020. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, so this forum was born out of the Foundation Summer 2020 Internship Program, which was really designed to empower students with financial and communications literacy in order to help us make sense of the world and also especially this crazy 2020 that we've all been experiencing. <laughs> um, so just to sort of give a layout, um, the topics that we'll be discussing um, include the impact of virtual learning, the importance of mental health issues among students, the intersectionality of race across the various fields of study, and the HAPA, or half Asian, half Caucasian experience. Um, and then we'll be doing this through a series of videos like Leslie had mentioned. Um, before we really get started, I want to thank my fellow organizers, Asako, Rachel, and Sophie. I also want to thank Leslie, Lisa and Mingi for allowing us this incredible platform to discuss these issues that are really relevant and matter to us. And I also want to get um, thank our guest speakers who will be joining us a bit later. And lastly, I want to thank the students and our friends who were featured in these videos for allowing us to have these conversations and then share it with all of you and this amazing audience and just being able to have that sort of dialogue and share our experiences, which I think is so important is when you're having conversations across generations just to be as personal and learning from everyone is when you're really going to make those connections and we can all just learn and grow and have fun and really have faith in the future. <laughs> um, and with that, I am going to get started with our first video, um, which is an interview that I conducted with my friend Haley Warren. And before I give too much away, I'm just going to let the video speak for itself. Um, Hello, my name is Marisa Nardo Mahoney. I am a recent Wellesley College graduate, class of 2020, and today I'll be presenting on the recent educational changes that students across the country have experienced as a direct result of COVID-19. I'll be interviewing current Wellesley College senior, Haley Warren, a psychology and education major, to discuss her experience as both a current Wellesley College student and educator in the K-12 through environment. I hope you enjoy. Hello, Haley. Uh, thank you again for speaking with us today. I hope you're doing well and all the craziness. Yeah, it's nice to see you too, Marisa. Um, how are you doing with the whole just life right now? And I know that you're home and taking classes uh, virtually. How has that been? How has this crazy fall been for you? 
It's been a lot. Um, I think that it's been a lot for everybody that I talk to and for various reasons. I know that for those of us who are in college and who are in college at Wellesley, like the system is new and like that is definitely a challenging thing. Um, yeah, like online learning is challenging anyway. And then the term system of seven weeks and so is something that like no one has ever done before. So it's a lot of information at once. Um, but you know, like you kind of learn to be flexible and figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What impact do you think virtual learning has had on your own experience of just like learning experience or that sort of element of taking risks or sort of forming those connections with your classmates? Yeah, I think that this is something I think a lot about. I think a lot about it from the perspective of being a student, and I think a lot about it from the perspective of as someone who is going to be a teacher. Um, and so I kind of have that like dual lens of like what does what is online learning like? And I think it is so challenging to be looking at a computer all day as someone who is a senior in college. And so then when I am student teaching online, I think a lot about how my students who are like nine to 11 year olds are feeling in this case, and they spend all like all day every day looking at computers too. And I think that that is very challenging. Um, so I think in terms of just like the fatigue of being on a screen all day is something that is very real right now. And I think that is really hard. Um, I know that when I went into the semester, I was thinking a lot about building class community and what that was like because when we switched to online learning in the spring, like we already knew all of our classmates. And so that was like essentially my experience and that was like the established community that we had, whatever that looked like, basically functioned the same way that it did in the classroom online. So like if it was a good established strong community with like connections with people, we still managed to have that online. And if it wasn't as strong of a community, like it didn't get stronger online. Um, but so I think that like coming into this fall, I was thinking and like was worried a lot about like, how do you build community in like with a class in this new space? Mm -hmm. And I think that a huge part of that is on the professors and I think that my professors have done an outstanding job of trying to build that community in an online space and it's not easy and I think that they given all the circumstances have really done a phenomenal job and sometimes it's funny because I'm because a lot of us have never met any of these people before <laughs> in person um, but I think that I have learned a lot. I am learning a lot in this in the setup and I'm interested in the classes that I'm taking, which is a huge impact, but it is so different to learn in the online space. It's so different to not be able to be in person with other people and like turn and like talk to the people during breaks because you really miss all of the small moments that come from being in person and you miss like the casual aspects of an in-person learning environment which is a lot of what does build that community. And so I think that that is something that feels really absent and also not being surrounded by other college students is something that I know that a lot of my friends and I have been reflecting on that like, although we might all study different things, we have this sense of we would spend time like doing work together, even if we're all doing our own thing. And so like not having that is pretty weird because you're just like, okay, I'm doing my work now, but there's no one else here yeah. to do it with. Um, yeah. So you kind of touched on it. You are an education major and I'm not sure what exact age group you're aiming for, but um, I know that you're currently, are you currently student teaching right now? And how yeah. is that working? Yeah. So I am currently student teaching and technically right now I'm in like, I'm in my pre-practicum. So I'm only part-time student teaching, but I am student teaching in two different places. So I'm student teaching in a school in Vermont where I am living currently, and that is in part to have the experience of doing some in-person teaching because school is in person. Well, school is hybrid here, so the students spend half of the week in school, so either they come to school on Tuesday and Friday or they come to school on Monday and Thursday and then everybody's remote on Wednesday or there's like a fully remote option but so 
I wanted to have some experience doing that work. And so I'm working with fifth through eighth graders in that position, but then the position that I'll be in for the whole year. um, And so in the spring, it will be completely full time um, is with third and fourth graders. And that is completely remote. Um, So yeah, that's like kind of the setup of the two. Yeah. Well, you were already mentioning how important it is to have that community in classes. Uh, How is it to sort of create that community when you have, third and fourth graders or fifth through eight. I mean, I'm guessing they might have already had classes together, at least know each other in some way. Does that make, I'm sure that helps a little bit. How, again, how do you build those communities? Or have there been kids who just like are maybe brand new or haven't really had that much interaction with each other yet? Yeah, I think I am still, I'm definitely, I, so I've been with the fifth through eighth graders since the beginning of September because school has been happening since the beginning of September. So four, four weeks now, I think. Um, yes. <laughs> and not positive on that one. But then I, the school I've been, Boston Public Schools just started two weeks ago. So they've been in school only for two weeks. So I've only been with that class for a little bit of time. Um, I think there's an interesting dynamic of the hybrid learning environment because kids are in school sometimes oh right right. so (laughs) they see some people um Uh and then they don't see other people and like with that in that case like those kids have that's a school where kids have gone together have gone to school together since kindergarten um a lot of them or if they're new to the community they might not have but they a lot of them have like know each other already and so Mm -hmm. that's a little bit different Um, I know that the school that I'm with in Boston is like a little bit different in the sense that some of them are new, some of them aren't, and it's a third and fourth grade classroom. So some of them is their second year in that classroom. But I think in both situations, like my mentor teachers are really kind of focused on like, how do you build this community? Because it's on everybody's mind uh, Mm. as like, this is a like connection is a really important thing right now. Oh yeah. Like it is always. Um, But I think that like, that is definitely a priority that pe- like they have been thinking about and modeling and like trying to figure out like what works best in like which situations um, and like just how you do that. Um, I guess this is sort of going into that question again with the building the community, but on another sort of level, how do you think juniors have been able to adjust to having either hybrid or being all virtual? I, I know I personally struggled with that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I really can only speak for myself Mm -hmm. Um, in that case. I think for me, it's hard. Um, It it definitely, it would be different if we hadn't done it in the spring. Um, Because I think that was like your practice round of like, oh, this is sort of how this works. Um, And then now you're like, oh, okay. (laughs) This is like really like how you do it full time. And I think like, nothing will ever replace in-person learning. Like that is Mm -hmm. like, that for me is like so like major and like that. It's also not the first time I took some online classes when I was in high school. So like, I think the thing is I'm not not used to that in like online environment, Mm -hmm. um, except that that was like the type of class where it was like online at your own pace, like or like with deadlines, but like you weren't really interacting with other people. And so the whole element of Zoom was not a thing. (laughs) Um, And so like synchronous learning wasn't a part of that. And so that is definitely something that is different. I think, I think it's very different for me in college than the way I like, like I observe my students interacting with it. I think that the way it's just, I think it's a very different situation when you're sometimes in school sometimes not in school and Mm -hmm. um I think it's there's a lot of challenges in like having the right structures in place to support like students in what they need Uh, so I think there's a lot of like it's hard to distinguish what comes from it being a new system and what comes from it being online Mm -hmm. Uh, you already touched on this with the whole in-person learning and can we do this regularly um I guess I know your opinion. I'm sort of curious. Is I've definitely heard talk about, oh, maybe virtual become more normal or just become a more typical option for people. What do you, do you think that's really sustainable uh, from an education perspective? Or do you think that we might go that route and then suddenly just be like, no, what? In-person is the way to go. When I think about 
like school. I think that to me, it's really important that you're able to build that community. And I personally think that like in-person learning is a really important environment. What I think that comes out of being in the online space is that there are a lot of different ways to connect with people that we might not have done otherwise. Hmm. And so when I think about working with families or connecting with even like for me, like connecting with professors. Uh, but when I think about working with families, a lot of times and how I want to like engage with families in my own teaching, a lot of times there's this like wall or this barrier of like they need to be able to come to the classroom or to the school, which is not necessarily, and like parent conferences happen at school and like mm. parent back to school nights happen at school. And I think that there, there is a lot of value in being able to have that like community space where you are in person with people. But I also think that when I think about building like connections and working with families, that's about accessibility. And that's about building relation, like positive relationships where your partners that works. And if that means that like conferences are virtual because that's what's going to work best, like that's, I think that's something that like has come up out of this online environment that like mm -hmm. should be an option and should stick because the way that we engage and the way that we like have opportunities to engage with people, like I think that is something that like will, I think that like a lot of people that I've talked to have started to be like, this should always be an option because mm -hmm. having an online option like does increase people being able to come because if you are like at work and you have a break, like you could talk on the phone or you could like hop into a Zoom meeting, that sort of situation, which like is very different. Uh, cool. Uh, thank you. I think that's probably all the questions I have for you. Um, I really appreciate your sitting down and speaking with me. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, so that was our talk for virtual learning, and we're going to move on to our next one, which was filmed by Sophie Apfel. Um, she's not here yet, but she'll be joining in a little bit. Um, just as a little bit of a review for hers, she decided to, to discuss the topic of mental health, um, which has always been very important among Gen Zers. The demographic has experienced higher rates of anxiety and depression, and that makes her making us more likely to either ourselves have experienced um, struggles with mental health or have friends who have experiences working with mental health, other issues. Um, so this will be an interesting roundtable discussion and hearing a little bit more about mental health from the Gen Z perspective. So I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I'm Sophie Apfel. I'm a college sophomore studying economics and I interned this summer with the China U.S. Men's Foundation and I'm working with them again this fall on the Gen Z Global Forum. And for my little blurb for the forum, I wanted to talk a little bit with my friends, have a roundtable discussion about our generation and mental health, um, and just kind of talk about it, talk about current events and see where we're all at right now. So just a little bit of introduction. Uh, as we all know, recently the COVID-19 pandemic has added unprecedented stress and anxiety to our generation. Um, the pandemic is really the first major historical event that our generation has had to grapple with, because many experts consider 9-11 to be like the inflection point between Gen Z and millennials. And like the other stress factors like mass shootings, rising suicide rates, climate change and global warming, immigration policy, sexual harassment and assault, the pandemic is something that we're having to deal with at a young age. Um, in early March, a lot of us had to make the quick, the quick transition home from college to online learning and saying rushed goodbyes to our friends and college campuses. And suddenly our generation was feeling lonelier than ever. Um, and now added on to that loneliness is just a sheer uncertainty for the future of the virus's spread, a vaccine, the health and safety of ourselves and our families and friends, as well as the prospect of entering the job market in a recession. Uh, however, Gen Z is trying to take our mental health into our own hands. Um, we're the generation most likely to seek help or treatment from mental health professionals, and Gen Z is using social media tools to connect with others. 31% um, of Gen Z surveyed said they're now more likely to vote in November because of gaining a new interest in politics that arose during the pandemic. 
83% shared that COVID-19 uh, has impacted their views on government and 82% of Gen Z believes that the pandemic has actually made them feel more solidarity with others around the world. So even in difficult times, Gen Z is working to make the best out of the situation and take control of their mental health and end the stigma surrounding mental health issues. And I look forward to the future for an inspiring society led by Gen Z individuals. So with that, I think we can all just go ahead around and introduce ourselves. Um, Anna, do you wanna start? Sure, I'm Anna. I'm a sophomore at Middlebury College. Um, I'm one of the co-presidents of our little um, Active Minds branch of the national nonprofit. Um, and I'm also really interested in psychology, working in a psychology lab currently and doing an independent study. Great. And I have a special interest in mental health. Uh, Sterling, do you want to share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Sterling. I'm a, I'm a sophomore at Amherst College and I guess my gateway into mental health is like just my own journey and like having been there with my friends through their own journeys. Um, and yeah, I've been able to like really firsthand see like what works for people and like where we're failing our peers as a society. Yeah. And finally, Gunjin. So I'm Gunjan, I'm also a sophomore, I go to Wellesley College, and my connection to mental health comes from, I would say like my South Asian background, there's um, really like a stigma around mental health, especially in my culture, and I think moving forward, the Gen Z within the South Asian culture, they're like trying really hard to get mental health to be more on people's radars, and saying that it's okay to feel things and to get help for it, and um, that's been really impactful, impactful for me. Yeah, I definitely feel like that's um, an issue that you see a lot in Chinese culture, East Asian culture as well. There's just not a lot of awareness surrounding mental health issues. So it's harder, I think, for those individuals from those backgrounds to find resources or get help if they need it. So I definitely agree um, with where you're coming from. Um, so I guess a question that I have is why do you think that Gen Z is so concerned other, rather than other generations with mental health awareness? Um, Anna, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I'm not sure that we're more concerned. I think we're just more willing to say that we're concerned to be open about it. And I think we're finally having conversations that we haven't had before. And there definitely is like a generational gap. Um, I mentioned this before in a discussion um, with you, Sophie, earlier. And I was kind of talking about how I have been like told by my parents and even like professors um, just like, kind of set, there are subtle things that are like, don't bring your mental health up in like a, um, like a professional context. Um, and like when I was applying for a job that I might be especially interested and passionate about because I've struggled with depression, my mom told me not to include that because it might be seen as like a burden or something that takes away from what I could add to the, sorry, <laughs> to the position. But I think it actually, that like, continues the stigma and by fighting against that and being really open about my struggles with mental health, um, I'm hoping that other people will be too. And I think a lot of people are talking about it on social media now for the first time. Um, and also like I've had a lot of conversations with my friends um, since high school and especially in college surrounding mental health. Um, Sterling, if you wanna go. Yeah, speaking of social media, I think like our conversations around social media and like how we have to perform and like the way that we're forced to interact with other people on social media, that's definitely been a big reason why it's like a huge talking point for our generation. Like just the way that we can interact with so many different people, it's just like a stress that like no other generation has had to deal with. Um, so I think we're just hyper aware of how that's affecting us and like what we can do to combat the way that it's affecting us, yeah. And Gunjin? Yeah, no, I definitely agree about the social media um, aspect of it all. I think that has a really big um, impact on how we're like talking about mental health. And I think it's bringing everyone a little more closer together and people are more willing to share their experiences because they see that maybe like celebrities are starting to share their experiences and they're like, oh, I relate to that. And they're willing to be more open about it. And also, I think, like, especially with the rise of TikTok, even, 
we get to kind of see like the raw part of people's lives. And that's kind of the part that no one has really been able to see before. And we're able to see that everyone kind of goes through the same things we do. And we're more willing to have a conversation and talk about like struggles we may go through because we see that other people are facing them too and that we're not alone. Yeah, I definitely yeah. agree. Yeah, I was just going to say, I do feel like uh, social media can definitely be used in this context to uh, create bridges among people and, you know, uh, people can understand that they're not alone or that they might even have a friend that they didn't even know who was uh, struggling with mental health issues or something like that. Yeah, um, I've actually used, oh, sorry. Go on, please. Um, I've actually used social media in that capacity for the first time starting in quarantine. Um, I started a social media account for our chapter of Active Minds, and actually we were able to recruit people that way and spread awareness. And I've interacted with people who have posted about their mental health, kind of, I think it's, it definitely increased with the pandemic and the social justice movements going on right now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when people post about their mental health, I'll respond to the story um, and I'll reach out and talk about any similarities and just, I always think it's a sign of strength when you post about your mental health um and i did that for the first time for national suicide prevention day and i've just found a way to connect with people that i wouldn't normally connect with and actually one of them we ended up having a long conversation and then i told her about the active minds club and now she's like one of our um like club members and she shows up every week to meetings and we just check in on how we are and so it's been really cool. And I've never used social media um, until this year in that sort of way and like kind of allowing myself to be vulnerable. That's really great. Um, that's really inspiring stuff. Um, and then I guess my last question for you all is what are the issues that you think are impacting Generation Z mental health the most? Um, if anybody wants to jump in. Um, I think, um, go ahead. Please go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I think we're thinking a lot, like our generation is thinking a lot about like what it means to be like a functioning member of society, like under capitalism, like, us, like American teenagers, American Gen Z. Mm -hmm. um, and we're thinking a lot about how that mindset of like having to have a nine to five job and like having to enter the workforce is going to affect our mental health. Um, and so, I think, what was the question specifically again? Just what are the issues that you think that are impacting our generation's mental health? Yeah, I think the stress of that, and then like I said, social media, like having to appeal to that many kinds of people um, are really taking a toll on us. Yeah. I agree that social media is kind of like a new stress source even like yeah it has its benefits in like connecting people but also it's like a huge source of um like a new kind of stress that people have to deal with and kind of like keep up appearances with and then also i think like because of social media and how quickly information can spread and with all like the social justice issues happening in our society right now i think that's definitely like a huge um thing that's been putting a toll on a lot of people yeah yeah i've struggled with social media too and i think that could be a big stressor um, and I actually, this is a really like niche subcomponent of social media, but I did a paper about how there's a proposed pathway between increased Facebook usage in young women around college age and decreased sexual assertiveness um, because of increased objectification. And there, like, there are a few studies that can, like, that consider the pathway very possible. And I think that's a little disturbing that because of social media, there's this change in women being less able to act assertively. And I think this is only heterosexual relationships that they looked at, but in that kind of scenario. And there are a lot of darker implications that that could have. Yeah, I think that's especially something that our foundation want to think about, you know, as a women's foundation is how, you know, social media can really be this uh, great way to connect with others and to learn more about mental health resources and to find out that you're not alone. But at the same time, you know, uh, figuring out how to curate it for yourself or use it in the most productive way to yourself that doesn't actually end up harming your own mental health. 
Um, does anybody have any final thoughts that they want to share? Um, if not, I can just end it here. Um, thank you all for talking with me about our generation and mental health. Um, it was really nice catching up with all of you. And thank you so much for talking with me. Sure, thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Alrighty, um, we're gonna move on to Rachel's. Rachel, do you wanna give like a quick intro to your talk? Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a sophomore at Wellesley College. Um, and I use she, her pronouns. And um, I decided to talk to some of my friends kind of about how like social injustices have come up in our college curriculum classes. Um, Cause I found it coming up in the two classes I was taking this term. And I just wanted to see if like other people were having um, like similar experiences with that because I found them very interesting. And I figured there's a lot of intersectionality between um, different like types of like topics. Um, so yeah. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a sophomore and I'm um, an economics major. And today we'll be discussing the intersectionality of the social justice movement and what we've been learning in our classes. Um, so as the social justice movement continues, I noticed some connections between the material I was learning in my classes and how it intersects um, with everything that's been going on politically. And I've noticed more discussions in my classes and amongst my peers about how what we're learning um, fits in towards working, fits in towards fixing some of these injustices or just about how they connect. Um, so now you guys can introduce yourselves. Well, my name is Hope. Um, I am also a sophomore here and my intention major is computer science. Um, yeah, Lily. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm a sophomore at Wellesley as well. Um, my major is anthropology at the moment. I'm considering a minor or a double major in CAMS. So the first question is, have you noticed more discussion of social injustices in your classes um, or just about how, like, have you thought about how your field of study um, like intersects and fits in with this whole movement? Do you want to I can go first. Um, so I'm um, an econ major and uh, my econ class was the one that like made me think about talking about this um, as my topic for discussion. And we were talking a lot about how different um, like policies that were implemented, what their intended effects were and like who they're trying to help. Um, but like also discussing how they were actually implemented and what the actual effects were. And it was really interesting Like we discussed um, the like PPP loans um, like from COVID and we read um, like a study that talked about how uh, it really ended up not, the money didn't end up going to the, um, the people and the small businesses that were actually hit the hardest. Um, like a disproportionate amount of the money was actually going towards uh, companies that were not very affected by it. And I just thought it was interesting. Um, we also discussed uh, like generational wealth and showing studies about like whether wealthier parents tend to have, or the kids who have wealthier parents also tend to be wealthier. And also um, we looked at different like food stamp programs and like the long-term effects of that and if it actually had substantial effects. Um, so I was just, it intrigued me, um, like all of the different things we were learning. So, yeah. I can go next. Um, so I think that this reminds me of, well, I took a CS class last year, CS 115, which is about like the internet and stuff like that. And so we discussed a lot of like, um, basically like trending news and things like that. And um, last year we talked about uh, violations of privacy or like just based, not violations necessarily, but like privacy settings on like applications such as Google and Facebook and stuff. But I noticed that I looked on their calendar this year and they've been talking a lot about the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, particularly recently the Ken Kenosha, um, like the, the shooting that had happened and the Facebook event where uh, they were asking attendees to bring weapons and it had been re reported by people a um, ton of times, but moderator didn't violate any rules, which and it ended in two deaths. So um, pretty tragic. And so I think like things like that, um, they'll incorporate 
uh, news like that into our classes, as well as this year, um, you and I are both taking this class, computer science, where we did a week where uh, we didn't go to class, rather read some of um, the, uh, I'd say like imbalances in the computer science um, kind of not just the department but as in general like the whole field of study and in particular I'd say like the um, artificial intelligence stuff since it is developed by uh, primarily white men it's influenced by that and it's biased in a way against um, I, I don't know much about the women aspect but especially people of color definitely is biased against them and so um, if you're using it to uh, pinpoint I don't know if you're using it to um if, yeah like if like facial reconstruction and stuff um if you put in the like um a high resolution or like a low resolution photo of a person of color it will like return one that like looks like a white person and it's just because they didn't really test it on um, people of like different ethnicities um because the people who developed it were primarily white males so it they're just, it's important that there needs to be more um, representation and also just like thought going into um, how these things are tested before they're made available to the general public. Right, especially because like as we move on, we're gonna start using these kind of technologies mm -hmm. more and more. Like an example, literally like a lot of iPhones these days have like, um, like face scanning stuff. So in order for everyone, um, people from all backgrounds to be included in kind of, in this kind of, uh, technology, we want to have the field and the developers themselves be diversified. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, we talk about, we take a very different angle in anthropology for um, discussion of social justice. It actually becomes kind of a delicate issue because um, while it is pivotal, there is this idea that um, assuming that one way is the right way is what we call ethnocentric. Um, and you sort of refuse to believe that um, a, a, some... The, the issue is that in this discipline, there is um, open conversation, which means not so much debate, and it comes, there is like no wrong point. Um, that said, we do a lot of discussion about the role that government plays in the suppression of social justice. Um, so capitalism, for example, is a topic that comes up quite a bit. Um, but one way I have noticed that I've been influenced by um, just the nature of the political climate today and, and all of the events that are taking place um, is in my work more, more so with um, like my media audit uh, mm -hmm. while as I'm working for a company trying to, we're, we're trying to push into the limelight the idea of One Health. Um, which, if you haven't heard of, is a coalition of several different, um, the, like, well, like, well-being organizations, so, like, physicians, dentists, even, um, we have environmental specialists, and veterinarians is a big one, so we're doing, like, a lot of zoonotic, um, research, because a lot of the reason that people are getting these contagious diseases, and, um, we have events like pandemics, is that, there is not a sustainable way to feed the number of people on the planet right now, and the people who are affected first are often in lower income areas. Um, and so like the issue becomes wet markets and meat markets and livestock and all mm -hmm. of that. So then we are want to say, as, as anthropologists from this perspective, we would say like, well, they're just doing it wrong. Um, but the truth is that we're all so interconnected, so we can't really push the idea of One Health until we push the idea that um, that not only are all species connected, but human beings are responsible for each other and ourselves. Um, so that is one way that the social justice issue has been pushed into um, my focus recently. Yeah, that, just, that definitely ties very directly into everything going on, not only like um, the social justice movement, but the pandemic is still very, like, very relevant and very much so happening. Um, it's very interesting to see how those kind of tie into each other because I feel like a lot of times people have been talking about them as like separate things or like they um, 
uh, the pandemic has really just made like the divide a lot greater, like socioeconomically, like the people who've been hit the hardest are the ones that were like struggling before as well. Um, so yeah, is there anything you guys want to add before we like wrap up and conclude? No. Vote. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's very important. I um, think that it's hard to um, find any kind of like area of study in college without it somehow bumping up against this issue of social justice just because it's so prevalent in our society today. Yeah. Um, I think just as everything's been brought to the limelight and also just like as I've gotten older and learned more things, it's become a lot more clear that things are so intersectional and like you have to be very conscious of not only just what you're focusing on but how it affects other groups of people a lot more like a lot more bigger a lot more of a bigger picture than I initially thought before um, yeah so thank you guys for your time and coming to discuss all of this um yeah so Thanks bye so Bye. Bye. Alrighty. Um, so that was Rachel's. I really liked that talk. And um, Lisako, would you like to give a brief presentation on yours? So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lisako Koga. I am also a sophomore here at Wellesley. I use she/her pronouns. And for my discussion, um, I gathered some of my Hapa or half Asian, half Caucasian friends together. And for me, I was always interested in this topic because. I grew up um, in a very like predominantly white neighborhood in New York City. So for me, being Asian, and being an Asian American was something that, um, and especially with the pandemic, and I know how there have been more instances of uh, discrimination and racism towards Asians, I just wondered how the COVID pandemic may have potentially affected their livelihoods as well. So, really good. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming out today, especially given how busy and hectic this term system is. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, we're just basically going to do a super casual discussion about how um, your part Asian identities have kind of shaped you and uh, yeah, basically been a big or a small part of your life. And I would just like to hear more about your experiences growing up, as well as maybe how they have pot potentially been impacted in the age of COVID-19. So maybe we can just start off by introducing ourselves. Um, so name, pronouns, class year, and if you feel comfortable just talking about your background. Cool. I can just um, can start. Anyone can go, yeah. <laughs> Ellie, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a sophomore. Um, I'm from San Francisco, California, and I am half white, half Chinese. Um, I think, at least for me, um, my Hapa identity has always been something that I felt really confident about, um, because growing up, I was enrolled in a Mandarin immersion school starting when I was like six years old. So, um, like, obviously growing up in America, there's a lot of white culture on that side, but um, at the same time, like through my education, I was exposed to a lot of Chinese culture and like I learned the language growing up. Um, I consider myself conversationally fluent, but not literate at this point. So um, I think that having that like aspect, like having education as a way for me to connect to my culture was really important because like as I grew up, I was kind of equally influenced um, by like both sides of my identity. Um, that was really helpful as a kind of, I like matured and was starting to like grapple with my identity. Um, it was kind of easy to like be secure in myself. And I would say that like, honestly, I don't see, I don't, I wouldn't think that like the pandemic altered the way that I think about my identity that much. I do like, this is a fun story, but um, because of the pandemic, I did take a summer class, which was Intro to Widgist at Wellesley with Meg, and um, we read a lot of feminist theory about like intersectional feminism, and I wrote a bunch of papers about like my identity and about um, like Hoppe women that I had been inspired by, and so this sparked a lot of really, really valuable conversation with Meg over the summer. Like we would talk for hours about kind of like the way that we perceived our identities, and so I think that like even though it wasn't a direct 
correlation with the pandemic. It definitely like fostered these conversations um, that kind of helped me with my own like self actualization. That was nice. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I can go next. I'm Meg, she, her pronouns. I'm also a sophomore. I'm from the Seattle area. Um, like Ellie, I'm half white and half Chinese. Um, I would say I'm grateful to have grown up in a place um, that had a lot of Asian people and a lot of half Asian people like me. So I like saw myself represented in my classmates pretty often. Um, and that my mom is from China. So I've been able to go um, and like speak some Chinese to my grandparents. I'm not as fluent as Ellie, but um, I have been taking Chinese for a while, which is nice. But um, I think in contrast, I haven't always been confident in my Hopi identity. Um, I think like with my mom's side of the family, they're from like mainland China where basically everybody there is fully Chinese. And my dad's side of the family is from like rural Michigan where everybody is white and like, like blue eyed white. So I think I like grew up always feeling slightly different from my family, like regardless of whether I was in China or Michigan. Um, so I think definitely it's been something weird to grapple with because I think that there's always like, con I don't know, with every race and like every like mix of races, there's always going to be like stereotypes or like beliefs about how somebody should be. So I don't know where I'm going with that. But I think that I've grown a lot more confident over the past year, largely thanks to like that we're just class or just like discussing um, like we are now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Erico. I'm a first year. I'm from Chicago. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm half white, half Japanese. And growing up, I grew up in a predominantly like white neighborhood and white schools, so I didn't really see myself represented um, in my class or with my teachers. And I think growing up, I wasn't ex I wasn't really like proud of like showcasing um, my cultural heritage. And I think oftentimes. There were there was only one other Asian girl in my class, and the teachers would always like mix our names up, and so I was like, I thought that was normal at the time. And my mother was born and raised in a very rural part of Japan, so whenever we went back, um, people would often like stare at me or like point at me or like walk up to me and like start saying like random English words. So I think growing up, I felt like pretty insecure about my identity, and I felt like there wasn't really like a niche or a place where I fit in. But then. Um, I think in high school and as I, you know, became part of a little bit more of a diverse community, um, I think I became a little bit more confident in my identity and I realized that there isn't anything for me to be like self-conscious or ashamed of or feel afraid of showcasing to my peers and to people around me. And so that definitely helped. And in the age of Corona, I can't really say it's impacted me one way or another. It's just made me a little bit more aware of my identity, I think. Thank you guys. So I guess like my first question or if you guys can just kind of bounce off one another, but um, I know some of you have mentioned how you felt potentially like a little bit insecure and other people have felt more like comfortable with expressing who they are. Um, just wondering what potential like influences have made you think that way, so, like the media or the books you've read or just any like personal experiences you have with some of your peers or other people around you. Let me think. I think like one thing I noticed, like especially in East Asia and like the parts of China that I visited or like I did exchange in Taipei, there's a lot of like white worship, you know, like the celebrities that they look up to are pretty much all white or they're at least half white. So like with total good intentions, I've like had a lot of people come up and be like, oh my God, I've always wanted a half Asian friend or like, oh my God, like I'm going to marry a white guy and my kid will look just like you, like that type of thing. Which, like, when I was, like, little hearing that type of stuff, I was like, oh, cool, like, that, that'll that make me have friends, and, like, that's a good thing. But, like, as I've gotten older, it just, like, was a major point of insecurity, I feel like, because I felt often times that, like, when people wanted to be my friend, if it was, like, an East Asian person who had maybe some, like, internalized racism or white worship, they just thought, like, the novelty of a half Asian person was cool. Or, like, with a white person, they, like, make comments, um that type of thing, like, oh, it's, like, so cool that you're Chinese, like, tell me about, like, how to use chopsticks, like, that type of thing, when I think, I don't know, like, maybe Erico and Ellie can speak to it, but I think that, like, at least for me, like, when somebody says, like, oh, you're Chinese, or, like, oh, you're white, it just doesn't feel right, because that's, like, only half of the identity, so, like, I feel like constantly being, like, boxed or, like, perceived 
more in one way or another is like a point of like internal crisis often. But um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Um, I think for me, like it was slightly different because um, I think do, I think just like the type of kids that like enroll in like Mandarin immersion programs in America tend to be either like Asian or half Asian. And so throughout my education, like I was like the majority, like the, it was like majority Hapa people in my grade from like elementary school through middle school. And obviously when I went to high school, like I wasn't in an immersion program anymore and it was just kind of like everyone. Um, but I was still like very, I, but I think at that point, like my like, consciousness had been shaped enough that like I thought that like being Hapa was really normal. Um, and I'd always grown up around like a lot of people that like had the same experiences as me. So um, I think that like contributed to me feeling more comfortable in my identity. Um, I also think that like for me what was what was mostly difficult to grapple with was like perception like I know like I've, I say this all the time but like I truly believe that like no I mean like no one really looks alike ever but like especially Hapa people like no two Hapa people ever look alike like my sister has like way lighter hair than me like um she has like darker skin like we all we like we have extremely different features and like kind of based on my experience and like terms of like the Hapa people that I've like grown up around like, like no one no like two Hapa people look alike and so um for me like kind of growing up in like looking at like western media and things like that um I would always like I really wanted like a Hapa like movie star or something or like celebrity to look up to but none of like even if they were Hapa like they would always have like vastly different experiences than me or they wouldn't look at all like me and so I think that was just like a point of insecurity because I was like, well, like we might have share like the same like racial background, but like you like based off like because it's all about like perception, I guess. And like so like they might have they must have like extremely different experiences from me because like we're perceived in different ways by like, I guess, white culture. Um, and I also think that like the way that and anyway. Um, and also, like, the, the kind of different types of, like, Hapa that I've noticed, like, I think contribute really heavily to, like, the way that people identify. Like, um, I don't personally identify as, like, a person of color in, like, a, a total sense because, like, even though racially I am half Chinese, I've benefited from white privilege my entire life. Um, and I've never been, like, discriminated against based off of my race, which I can, which, like, I know, like, a lot of other Hapa people have, like, have experienced like way worse um and so I think that based off of like looks it's really difficult to judge like someone's experience and the way they identify um so that's just kind of something I'm always thinking about with regards to Hapa identity like even though we all might like share the same like racial breakdown like there are vastly different experiences across that yeah I was gonna say I think I definitely had a lot of like internalized racism growing up and even like throughout high school I definitely thought that there was a side of my identity that I wanted to hide just because growing up in like a predominantly white area um, with with teachers and classmates who are all white people would you know often call me like exotic or like like oh you look so different like what are you or you know they would ask I think it was it wasn't meant to be offensive or anything like that it was just out of ignorance but it definitely made me fully realized that, you know, I am not white, but at the same time, I'm not 100% Asian. And so I think I struggled a lot with like, when people ask me like, what are you? Like, do I say I'm Asian? Am I Asian American? Am I half? Like how, how can I explain it to people in a way that they'll understand? Cause I knew I wasn't fully Japanese. I knew I wasn't fully white. So sort of trying to navigate that was pretty difficult. And sort of like what Ellie said, I think, especially in the media, not seeing Hapa celebrities or Hapa like actors, actresses, that definitely made me feel like I felt like, you know, I'm a minority. And so I think, yeah, that was just something that I was aware of. And um, I think now you see that a lot of that East Asian culture is kind of becoming like popular and mainstream with like K-pop or like K-beauty or like, you know, East Asian food even. So I think when that wasn't like a big wave and when, when people still thought like, oh, like they don't know anything about East Asia. They just thought it was just some foreign country with, with like oriental um, things and traits. Um, I think there were a lot of comments made out of ignorance that sort of hurt me and how I perceive myself. But I think, 
Now with more representation in media, that's definitely changed. Um, I guess just to kind of bounce off of that, um, the three of you have all kind of mentioned that over the years you've learned to kind of become more comfortable or at least accept your hot identities. And I was just wondering, aside from like the fact that you have seen more representation and you know the fact that East Asian culture especially has become a lot more mainstream, how has, for instance, like the impact of seeing other HAPA individuals around you? So not just in media, but within your friends or just, or otherwise. Um, yeah, if that's potentially been a turning point or, to, or if you, um, like you coming to Wellesley and meeting other more HAPA people has kind of shaped your perception. Um, I think that the HAPA people that I've met here um, have very different outlooks towards being HAPA than they did in my high school. Because I noticed like, I don't know, back where I came from, people would, like my HAPA friends, I'd like find them and be like, oh, like, let's talk about being HAPA. But they'd always like, identify much more strongly with either being white or being Asian. Like sometimes they'd be like, oh, like I don't, I don't care about like Chinese as a language or like I don't, I don't know anything about that. Or they'd be like, um, they just constantly act as if they had no white privilege, which I thought was a little bit problematic. I never like met anybody who I felt like, like completely accepted the duality of it. But I feel very different about the Hoppe people I've met at Wellesley. Um, I also like really like the term Hoppe which I hadn't been using until like Ellie started using it more. And I was be like, I'm half white, half Asian. And it was always like this, like, you know, separateness. But I feel like Hoppe is just a nice, like, it makes it whole, like you're 100% Hoppe, you're not like 50% something and 50% something else. Yeah. I agree. I think that, I, <laughs> I mean, I've noticed that since coming to Wellesley, like um, a lot of people from the East Coast or like the Midwest that I've heard are like, I identify as Asian, which is like technically, I guess more accurate um, but also, I don't personally like it because there's no, first of all, there's no A in white. Second of all, it's just not a very, a, like, pretty term compared to hapa. Like, that is such a beautiful word. And I know we, like, low-key appropriated it from Hawaii, but, like, at the same time, they're okay with us, like, using it for the most part. And, like, it's just, like, I think it's definitely more of a West Coast thing um, to, like, use the word hapa. But, like, I, I found, like, so much empowerment in that term and being able to like identify with that. Um, I would say that like, this is like kind of weird, but like, I think throughout high school and college, like I've like gotten like way more kind of comfortable with talking about race and talking about my identity. And like, so I have felt like really connected with like the hop of people that I've discussed in these two like spheres. However, like, because of the amount of Papa people from where I'm from, like, everyone there was, like, we, we all had, like, pretty similar experiences. We were all, like, generally, like, secure in our identity, and, um, like, it was just, it was a kind of a different shift coming to college where, like, everyone was from some, like, like, different places. Like, everyone came with really different experiences, um, and I would say that, like, it's not, I don't like I, I think back home I was like oh I feel the same way as everyone else but coming to college I was like oh my god like there are people who have had like vastly different experiences in terms of like their like road to like acceptance I guess of identity and that was something I hadn't really thought about because of like my like, I guess privilege of like growing up in a majority hoppo like society and then when I got here I was like wait there are like people who, for whom this was not normal um and so I but like I think that having my like having an outlook of positivity and like being really secure in my identity has hopefully like made the conversations that I've had with the Hoppe people here like good. I don't know. I feel like the more you can like set an example for like being, I mean, you can't just be like be secure in your identity, but like the more confidence you bring to it, like the better, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've only been here for about a month and, but just spending time with other people that do identify as HAPA has been really empowering because I didn't really have that community back home. And so, and this is like a, a first conversation that I've ever had where I sort of address this part of myself. So, so far it's great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think that's it for my questions. So thank you all so much. But if any of you have any other like final thoughts or just other things you wanted to potentially throw out there, be more than happy. Wait, I just want to say that, like, it's very, I think that every time I, like, take the time to sit down with, like, other Hoppa people and, like, discuss identity is a time where, in which I, like, grow 
I guess, or like I learn more. Um, and it's always like really valuable to me and my own happiness when I do this. So thank you guys so much for like engaging with this conversation and I hope we can do it more often. I think we should like normalize talking about Hapa identity like as much as we can because it's such a source of joy for me at least and like I like it. No, yeah. thank you all so much for coming out. Um, I know that I definitely cannot relate to any of the experiences that you guys have had but it has been really enlightening and interesting to hear about all of your experiences. So thank you so much for being comfortable enough to share them all with me and everyone here. So yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> that concludes our videos. Um, I just wanna say thank you again for everyone who are um, my fellow uh, organizers and again, your friends for agreeing to doing this and allowing us to show these videos. Um, and so I'm gonna pass it back off to Leslie as we transition into the cocktail hour. So oh, thank you so much, Marisa and Misako and Rachel and Sophie. It's just been wonderful. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, this is an area I think Zoom really excels. It's like oral history in the modern age. It really does capture the zeitgeist. Um, we have two experts who can probably opine on this, but it you know, I personally have done like oral histories uh, when I was uh, younger with like Holocaust survivors and it was very like, you know, in person and very strong. Um, that immediacy of um, discussion I thought was captured in a lot of these videos on topics that are quite sensitive. So um, great, thank you so much. Um, now in the cocktail hour, in the good old days, we'd like get our Prosecco and our beer and we would, you know, kind of relax and then welcome our next guests who were so pleased to maybe expand the conversation. We've been really living with the Gen Z generation for the last hour, uh, Mingwei and Quinn, um, and I'll let Marissa give the introductions, are professors at Wellesley College. Um, for your information, um, uh, professors, um, the founders of the China U.S. Women's Foundation uh, are Wellesley graduates and Mingyi is from Shanghai. So we're speaking all the same language, uh, <laughs> hopefully clearly, um, but it's great to now broaden the conversation about Gen Z. Um, Professor Song, you probably have uh, insights about the experience in China and you, Professor Slobodian, being a globalist and also a European scholar, might be able to opine on Gen Z uh, in Europe or whatever your thoughts are. But anyway, uh, thanks so much for joining us and I'll pass it on to Marisa to make the formal introductions. Um, hello, professors. Thank you for joining us. Really excited to have you and thank you for agreeing to um, be on the call today. Um, I'll just start off with giving a brief introduction um, for Professor Song first. Um, so since joining the faculty at Wellesley College in 2007, Professor Song has designed, um, renovated, and taught a variety of courses covering the literature, film, and pop culture of modern China. Professor Song's pedagogy emphasizes the balance between close reading and critical thinking and evokes a sympathetic understanding with historical analysis and intercultural literacy. Um, for Professor Slobodian's, uh, Slobodian's um, intro, um, Professor Slobodian has um, teaching places his history, um, places histories of modern Europe in the history of the larger world. Um, this goal is pursued in classes with topics as diverse as the history of cities, world economic orders, gender and sexuality, and the exhibition of ethnic performers as savages in the 19th century Europe. Um, so again, thank you both, and I will allow you to each to introduce yourself and give you the um, background on your own research. Um, Professor Song, I guess, would you like to start? Okay, thank you Marisa for inviting me to this uh, forum, uh, this cocktail party, and uh, thanks uh, Leslie for organizing this. Um, uh, perhaps I will, I will just uh, talk a little bit about my own research. Uh, uh, I did uh, uh, write a book on youth, or rather the history of youth. Uh, in which I did not take youth as a, a, like a, 
uh, something we can take for granted. It's, it is rather the result of a very intense uh, discursive uh, uh, sort of negotiations over the past uh, 200 years. And my uh, focus was particularly placed on the, the, the rise of uh, the so-called new youth uh, that remained as a central, uh, sort of a central symbolic trope, trope or symbolic figure um, in, in the making of a, a modern Chinese national identity. Um, and uh, so it's, a, it, it's, it's rather a cultural study of, a, of a, the discursive uh, construction of youth uh, through uh, work on intellectual, intellectual history, um, literature, um, and uh, um, more or less uh, that's what I uh, did in that area. So actually, I, I brought the book with me. So the result of the book that I published uh, 2014 uh, with Harvard, uh, Young China, um, National Rejuvenation and the Buildings Room, uh, a particular form of the narrative uh, focusing on the growth of youth, psychological or uh, intellectual growth of youth. Um, my book covered the, the, the time period from uh, uh, from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. Um, what I did not really look at is uh, the post-1949, uh, uh, the change of the regime, the communist culture, and all the way. Uh, those were things that I did not uh, uh, look at in this book. But I did think about uh, uh, what happened later. I I I believed uh, for the uh, for the generations that we can perhaps compare to the American ways of uh, uh, differentiating different generations in the post-war years. Uh, in China, there was also a very similar uh, boomer generation um, growing up in the early more years uh, during the relatively uh, peaceful years after the nineteen. 49 uh, end of the civil war. Uh, then the Cultural Revolution saw the birth of the generation of the Red Guards uh, who, uh, in, who had their own way of uh, uh, political intervention and uh, um, then also saw a high, um, kind of a saw, saw the high idealism uh, that uh, uh, kept uh, um, bringing back a lot of the, uh, the culture uh, meanings attached to the new youth or young China in the early time period. Then uh, this continued all the way until the early reform era, and uh, I, I think we 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 saw uh, the pro democracy um, movement uh, in China uh, in throughout the nineteen uh, from the late nineteen seventies to all the way to nineteen eighty nine. Uh, well, a lot of uh, current for 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 the current generation, Gen Z in particular, they perhaps saw the, um, the, the time period between the, if, if I can say so, perhaps the, the Trump administration, COVID-19, and a lot of the uh, historical events happening right now, uh, that perhaps would be the defining uh, factors in the, make, in the making of their own historical consciousness. But for for the for the Chinese youth uh, growing up in the reform era, I think the end of the idealism uh, at the uh, end of the 1980s uh, perhaps characterized the, the entire generation's intellectual uh, outlook. Then after that, the the end of idealism saw uh, actually saw the uh, the quick rise of the market economy and the China's entry into the global um, world market and uh, um, the economic miracle, everything uh, associated with uh, uh, making money uh, while talking less about the politics, that, uh, that changed the outlook of Chinese youth uh, in the post-1989 uh, social and cultural atmosphere. So that's something I mentioned at the end of my book. Um, to talk about this sea change happening to uh, Chinese youth culture, um, the departure from the political engagement, high idealism, 
um, and then this uh, uh, sort of a, an increasing um, integration to the uh, to the uh, economic system uh, with a, uh, a focus on um, the more uh, for, for the less uh, um, uh, perhaps less culture or political engagement while more in more participation in the economic uh, work then that's that's actually what i did with my first book and since then i actually uh, also uh, have been working on science fiction that i think marissa mentioned this when when she talked uh, talked to me so this <laughs> There's another book published with uh, Columbia showed the, um, the, uh, this new um, research area I've been working on. I, I think, I think uh, well, now I think about these two projects uh, in connection with this forum. I thought, yes, indeed, there's a connection there because science fiction was also, um, has, al has also been mainly a genre associated with youth, with uh, with uh, young people. It repre represents the future, represents embrace with technology. The science fiction, science fiction culture certainly shows um, a lot of the new changes that happen to our society. Um, and also, science fiction is a global genre. It's not, a, you can barely talk about uh, one nation's um, uh, confrontation with uh, the, the end of the world uh, is always you know human beings as a um, as a, uh, a, a global entity um, confronting with all the science fiction scenarios so this is a, this global genre brought um, many questions that Chinese science fiction asked to the to uh, link them to the uh, to the same topics that we talk about in the United States, um, like environmental crisis, like uh, um, the virtual reality that uh, uh, are gradually repla replacing how we feel and think about uh, the social realities, and the different ways of uh, um, uh, making friends and uh, um, developing the person personality. All of those things are perhaps more particularly associated with how we view uh, Gen, Gen, uh, Gen Z generation either in the United States or in China. So this, this is my background, I, I, my research background. I, I, I think I will stop now, I'd like to uh, Professor Slobodin take over. Professor? Hi everybody. Um, I mean, generation isn't really a key category for me. It's not something I use in my work or think about all that much as an academic. So my comments would be rather more general and based on my own experience. Um, it seems like Gen Zs themselves are a minority in this in this mosaic here. So it's a usual situation of old people talking about young people. Um, but I started at Wellesley at, in 2008, which is interesting because it's sort of the tail end of the millennials, right? So I. So I started teaching young millennials, and now I teach what I guess will eventually become old Gen Z. And thinking about the China-US relationship, I mean, a lot has happened in those 12 years that I think will have uh, repercussions for the life chances of perhaps all graduating um, students of of Wellesley and especially people who do have some kind of personal connection to China and perhaps a desire to live between somehow the worlds of China and the worlds of the United States. And the way I think about it kind of schematically is this, is that, you know, with the collapse of the, the financial bubble in 2008, you know, a particular career path that was open to many Wellesley students, regardless of what major they had, which was the pipeline to investment banks, to I-banks, more or less dried up, right? It more or less closed off, right? I think for that period, that boom period of sort of late 90s to 2008, it was possible as a relatively intelligent member of the educated elite to leave college and walk into a very highly compensated job and lead a comfortable life if that was something that you were comfortable with ethically. And, and so on. 
amplitude of that data very abruptly changed. But in that interregnum between 2008 and 2016, you know, there was, this was the real kind of China moment in a way for American capitalism, I think, you know, the, the absolute enmeshment of the two economies um, really continued at a galloping pace. Um, and also for the world of the elites, whether it was, you know, having a, having a, a, a nice job with, you know, a KPMG or a PWC or what, or if it was being a, you know, professor of media studies or being a young artist, there were suddenly opportunities for you to often more opportunities on the Chinese side, newer opportunities than there were here in the United States or in North America. So this, I mean, the, the whole direction seemed to be towards greater integration and greater kind of melding of what, you know, the historian Neil Ferguson famously called Chimerica in this period, right? There really weren't that many voices um, countering this publicly, I think, or kind of even culturally. It was kind of, you know, Hollywood did some changes to make the movies, you know, palatable to Chinese audiences, maybe even shot them elsewhere, cast different characters, and these things were just the way of the world, right? It was a sort of a continuation of the globalization story that we'd heard throughout the 1990s, except with a very particular focus on the bilateral US-China relationship. Well, needless to say, that's all changed since 2016, right? I mean, the what was a very fringe position even within the Trump Republican Party, has now not only taken over the Republican Party, but I would say has won a consensus in the Democratic Party too, and with allies like the European Union and Canada, meaning that from an era of relatively inevitable interconnection, um, we have now entered uh, a space of quite serious, what they call geoeconomic, competition between what are becoming kind of the new trade blocks of the US and its allies, UK, EU, and Canada and Mexico against China. And this obviously, you know, is very disturbing, not only from the point of view of, you know, global security and kind of world peace, um, but also especially for people who feel personally invested for whatever reason, I would even count myself among them with, with having a mobility between the worlds of, you know, China and Hong Kong and the United States as something that's natural and not something that has a series of um, diplomatic and, and even kind of, you know, um, bureaucratic barriers thrown up in front of it. So the, the era of kind of integration seems to be over and the era of retrenchment and the retreat behind, um, mutually uh, competing or mutually exclusive zones of economic enrichment is, is, is with us now. And that seems to be, um, that would seem to me to be a very big reality facing a Gen Z um, young person, especially someone who has any sort of ties to China. That this idea of being able to live between the two spaces or move fluidly between them is much less likely than it was five years ago. And that the prospect of needing to kind of make a choice, which wouldn't have been there five years ago is probably part of life now. You know, do you want to make the choice to make a career in China, mainland China? Or do you want to make a choice to stay here? And if you stay here and you happen to have a Chinese passport, how long are you gonna spend at the airport? I mean, this is, this is, this is a reality now, I think. And, um, I think it's it's a special challenge that you know the, the the putative audience for this for some forum like this would would all be would all be facing. But that's my that's my take. I'm happy to I'm happy to hear what other people have to say or just kind of have a more open ended conversation on this. Uh, thank you both. Uh, this would be a great time to um, really open it up. Have just that open dialogue that Professor Slobodian had just referenced. If you have any questions, this is also a great time to ask those as well.
I'd like just to ask, um, because, you know, it's kind of, um, Professor Slobodian, you know, that's like the macro view. And by the way, um, these ladies um, were all part of a um, group this summer, an internship uh, modeled after um, Adam Tooze's um, Crashed. Um, we wrote a new book called Smashed about, you know, Gen Z from that kind of perspective. And so kind of breaking it up into little bits. And one of my kind of uh, realizations from this forum is that um, Gen Z, of course, they're young, they're resilient, they're looking to the future, but they kind of break up the world into different parts through social media, through their particular interests. And that maybe it won't be that they have to choose anymore, like, are you living in China? Are you living in America? Maybe it will all be much more of a hybrid. Hopefully we'll get finished with the pandemic so that you could fly around. Now it's kind of difficult to imagine. But maybe it will be, it won't be so cut and dry. Um, what do you ladies who are, you know, members of Gen Z think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's like an interesting point, especially because like with everything going so virtual now, it does make things a lot more accessible to like meet with people in different time zones, um, things like that. And it's just like opened up, I think, a lot of like different opportunities. Um, and yeah, so I'm interested to see, I think that kind of goes hand in hand with like what sticks, like um, with how we've adjusted to working during a pandemic. Um, and I think that would definitely play into it. Uh, yeah, because I, I think it is, po I don't really know, but maybe it is possible to kind of have them um, like cross and like it would be possible to. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's nice as an optimistic way of looking at it, but I'm not just talking about the pandemic, right? I mean, the, the exclusion of Huawei, the arrest of the CEO in Vancouver Airport, the attempt to ban WeChat and, and TikTok. I mean, these are only tangentially related to coronavirus. And the, you know, the great firewall is, does exist. You know, we don't live actually in one big internet as we might have hoped at some point. So I think there are, I mean, I think it would be naive to think that that those obstacles are going away magically. Um, Biden is not going to change direction on that overly as far as he's signaling. So yeah, you could use a VPN. You can watch YouTube and Google, use Google even if you're in mainland, but that kind of ease of mobility is it's i mean that i don't know what, what maybe what i'd be interested to hear what what mingway thinks about that is that frictionlessness movement coming back anytime soon do you think um i i, I, I certainly doubt it i think queen raised a, a very in, a very good question about what's um, what's happening now and what's going to happen next um I think for for my generation, I, I really grew up in uh, from the late 1980s. I would say uh, 1980s still um, was very important to my generation. I, I I think for 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 the Chinese growing up in that time period, uh, there was always a tendency uh, to to that's like opening up China to. Um, to 走向世界, that is to go into the world as if China was not a part of the world. But literally, that was the process when China was about to enter the world. Uh, then, uh, like 40 years, almost 40 years later, it would be imagined that this should be something as a given, but it's not. It's actually, it's a, it shows the the divide widening up uh, very quickly uh, since the peak of uh, um, like the, 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 the Chinese uh, Olympics and the uh, expo uh, that happened as a uh, Queen said this uh, China moment. Um, then after that, it looks like there was a conservative uh, trend that took over. Uh, and it's not just that, it's also combined with uh, the more and more emphasis on technology. 
And uh, this also changed a lot, changed a lot how people uh, uh, thought about the world and uh, uh, thought about how one can engage the world. Uh, I actually, uh, uh, after I received the Marisa's invitation, I did a little research asking uh, some of uh, uh, the, I would say Gen Z, uh, actual Gen Z students, either in China or, or in the United States. What I, what I learned uh, seems to be, um, well, the, uh, the, 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 the young people from both sides agreed that there was an increasing reliance on technology or the, 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 the technology defined uh, 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 sensibilities and uh, things how, how, how you can use to, to understand the world. Um, but in China, that trend seemed to be, uh, to be developing mass, much faster than what happened in the, in the United States. One thing that the student told me is that in the United States, uh, when you have a virtual community, it's still very much based on like the same group of the people uh, or like uh, uh, people you know or, or you know belonging to the same community. There is a still some kind of a, uh, organic uh, uh, community behind this. But in, in China, it looks like the, the split between the virtual and the organic between between the virtual and the real um, is a, is a really is really a big issue now. Uh, then that stopped uh, that cut off some connection between how you feel about yourself and how you feel about the world. So uh, so for example, for for the uh, you perhaps heard of this uh, term, uh, uh, little pinks or li little pinkies, uh, meaning uh, those. Young younger people who felt uh, more or less supportive of the um, the nationalist and uh, um, or, or, or communist ideology, uh, not uh, not through being really political, but actually through being um, more or less uh, exposed to that culture while studying in in the United States, studying abroad, um, they actually felt. Uh, uh, even been uh, attracted to that ideology even even more than before. Uh, I, that that happened in a situation that's still connected to the to some kind of a, uh, experience based on the encounter with the some reality that's really there. But if we look at the situation that happened in China. Over the past several years, over the past two to three years, or particularly this past year, because after the pandemic, there was a lot of social controversies happening in China. There were a lot of clashes between different ideas happening there. Then, if you look at the the the, the younger generation, uh, meaning those are uh, teenagers, uh, truly the Gen Z. Uh, in, Chi in the Chinese context, they perhaps they, they felt less connected to whatever real feelings about uh, the the things that are po that are political. So when they uh, expressed a certain political opinions, it's more like you you retweet something you know on WeChat or on um, it's without giving it a thought uh, based on the processing of the experience drawn from the reality. So it's 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 getting even more virtue than um, than 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 for the generation that we can call the little pinkies. So that's that's something that I I felt. I don't know how this is going to change. If uh, if this is the case, it's something um, more profoundly redefining. Um, the idea of youth, of course, uh, if we can relate it to my own research uh, in that area, then um, this is not just caused by the pandemic, but the pandemic radicalized that trend, made it happen even more forcefully. Yeah, I mean, they have a kind of uh, 
interesting parallel to this from work that I have done, which is about East Germany. Mm -hmm. And in the 1950s, East Germany and the People's Republic of China were close partners. And um, young East Germans learned Chinese and they learned Chinese songs, they learned about Chinese art and they learned Chinese opera. <clears throat> and they, in many cases, traveled to China and vice versa, Chinese students came to East Germany and learned German and learned Schiller and Goethe and all the rest of it. But then when the so-called Sino-Soviet split happened and Mao and, Stal and, and, and um, Stalin stopped being friends, let's say, East Germany joined the Soviet Union and now suddenly China was the enemy. And so all of these people who had been studying Chinese and absorbing Chinese culture in the interest of solidarity and internationalist partnership now became the experts in studying the new geopolitical rival which was the PRC. So you had these rival forms of communism now. And it was very unexpected for the people involved and very surprising. And I know I've actually sort of read the accounts of people who had been these kind of Sinophiles, like it had actually just been kind of young white West Germans who fell in love with, with Chinese culture and literature, who now had to refashion themselves as, you know, um, experts in the mind of the, of the enemy. And it was very disorienting and unpleasant. And, that's one path that America could go down in the next couple of years. So for example, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the public school closest to us where our four-year-old will go teaches Chinese as a matter of course to every single student, uh, half an hour a day, or Chinese immersion. And that's an artifact of the China moment. What will that look like two years ago? Will it be canceled altogether? Or will it be something that now is seen as a way of getting an edge on keeping one step ahead of these, you know, agents of industrial espionage and da 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 and all of the kind of xenophobic rhetoric that we're that we're hearing now about um, the Chinese competitor? And and I I do think it's a it's a very delicate moment. And I think that if, if should Biden be elected, it's going to be very very important for him to signal strongly that he does not want to turn this into a relationship of enmity and start a sort of Sino-American split 2.0 or a Cold War 2.0. I mean, it's going, to have, it's going to be very important for him to do that, not just for the macro level, but for the everyday experience of people who scan as Chinese to white people, to be quite honest. I think that's going to become a very serious, a very serious matter. Um, so, yeah, I don't mean to be alarmist, but I, but I do think that you know, we, we do need to be mindful of that and not think that it's going to be kind of business as usual and that there might have to be some kind of, you know, strategizing pressure. I know that when Biden ran a very anti-China ad earlier in the campaign, there was a big backlash and he's since walked that back, I think, wisely. So I think that kind of, you know, vigilance about um, the outburst of sort of anti-Chinese racism is actually really important right now, I think, personally. Actually, just uh, uh, to uh, to look at China, actually, there's there's an increasing um, could it be called anti-American sentimentality as well. Um, this was rather radicalized uh, during the Trump um, administration. Um, so it looks like this uh, a lot of the things that happened in the, in the United States. Uh, eventually sabotaged uh, uh, the uh, the plans for for the reform in China, but you would think trade war, everything like that, should push China toward more reform. But that's not what was happening. What's happening is that it set back the reform. It uh, radicalized uh, the the conservatives in China, so gave voices to uh, extreme nationalism and. Uh, so that that changed the picture as well. That made uh, uh, those who uh, usually uh, uh, are Americanists or pro-American um, scholars, intellectuals, very hard, uh, very difficult to to continue um, uh, voicing out, uh, uh, voicing uh, that sort of opinions in China right now. But uh, I just actually, I paid attention to some news uh, yesterday. Uh, yesterday it's uh, uh, reported that, uh, you know, TOEFL, TOEFL, that's uh, the test everyone needs to take. 
in order to come to the United States to study. Uh, when they uh, opened uh, uh, the, the when when they opened the registration for TOEFL tests in Beijing and Shanghai, just within 24 hours, all, all booked. <laughs> so that means there's still a lot of uh, uh, young people who wanted to come to the United States. Probably that speaks to some will. Uh, or the UK or Canada or Australia. Oh. Yeah. Do you need TOEFL for those? Schools no, too. no, no. For 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 uh, TOEFL is only for uh, the United oh. States. Okay. For, yeah, for UK, Australia. I think for the uh, for the common virus, uh, for uh, uh, the British, um, that's a different thing. It's called. Isle. Yeah, Isle. Yes, that's, that's different. Yeah. Thoughts or questions from the gathered participants here? Um, if I may. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to thank to Mingyi and also Leslie um, for um, having, you know, for this invite. And uh, this is really eye-opening experience to me because to be honest, I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> but by listening to all the speakers and also the panelists and plus the in-depth discussion between two professors and I just feel so uh, like, okay, so thrill be able to have uh, a further understanding. And um, first of all, I am a big fan. Actually, I am a firm believer for cross-generational learning. So um, talking about myself, actually, I am a Gen X. So I guess like a mapping to some of our panelists, um, like sharing and in comments, I'm probably like one of the moms that you refer to not to identify yourself, like, okay, the vulnerability part. So I guess uh, the, I, I do have the question, if I may, for both professors and also our panelists over here. So with this, like, okay, the situation that we are facing right now, how can we further help our like help our gen z like okay and to better position themselves disregard that they are like okay working on their degree in uh, this country or they are born here or across generational you know what might what might be something that we can do as an older generation that we can help we can support well um i certainly see the um uh, a lot of the uh, challenging moments for our students right now. And I, I, I've been talking with students who came from China, um, stuck in the situation that Professor Svobodin just uh, described. Um, it's a very diff difficult choice for them. And uh, to look at the future, it's full of uncertainties now. Um, but I would say, um, to keep uh, a relatively more tolerant uh, attitude toward uh, uh, diversity, toward uh, um, uh, different things, the other, the other um, possibilities that's uh, uh, not here right now in this moment, the potentials is very important. I think it's a, it's a, um, we don't know if all doors are shut now. Uh, then that's it. We 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 should keep certain possibilities still there um, to keep some doors still open. I I, I strongly believe in conversations and dialogues. Um, I I hope uh, a better situation will happen after after this November election after some changes after the 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 um the the pandemic is uh, going to be getting better or to give us some normalcy so we need to be ready for uh, i mean for our students we need to be ready for um for something that is not just like this so Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, a great deal of the problems of the world come about by misrecognizing things that are global issues 
for being national issues or as being prone to having national solutions. And to give two examples there, I mean, I think labor politics and climate politics are two things that are currently keeping the United States and China apart or in a, set, in a feeling of competition when they could and should be the grounds for some kind of cooperation. So I think it's important to see that that competition with China in manufacturing has had structural effects on American employment in, spe in specific parts of the United States. So there are specific parts of the Midwest where people who had good paying jobs, reliable work in factories now no longer have that, partially because of automation, partially because that work is being done for less in China. And generation of policymakers, both Democrat and Republican, had let that happen. They've encouraged that to happen, actually. And they've turned a blind eye to the drastic social effects that that's had at the town by town level across places like Wisconsin and Ohio and Michigan. And they paid for it, right? And they paid for it electorally in 2016. And in a way, they deserved it, right? They, they needed to be woken up and, and given a slap. And so now they have they better get take the right lesson from it, right? And the wrong lesson is China is the enemy, China is the competitor. We now need to punish China because we gave away all of our technology and jobs to them. And that's not an accurate way to describe it. It lets the American policymakers off the hook for one for one thing. And it also um, assumes that China is one big blob of a block where the kind of benefits of this kind of manufacturing boom have been evenly distributed, right? I mean, we all know that working conditions in Chinese factories aren't exactly great. There's a lot more in common between someone who's unemployed or underemployed in much of China and those people in the Midwest. They're, they have common experiences, day-to-day -day life, of getting by, feeding their kids, you know, being overworked, getting hurt on the job, and so on. So there needs to be a way to make visible those similarities, right, rather than the differences. So that when someone feels angry about inequality in the United States, they don't think that the answer is to, you know, take money from the other country or whatever. They need to say that what we need to do is create a new arrangement whereby people who are suffering there and here both have new institutional ways of demanding um, better from their employers, from their policymakers. So the, building those kind of cross-border alliances across class, um, within classes, but across borders is, I think, <laughs> it's a big challenge, but it's one that not enough energy is being devoted to. And I think that average Americans, and I'm Canadian, and I would say I'm, I'm from Western Canada, so especially from around here, British Columbia, you know, the, the face of China that you see is largely the most privileged people in, <laughs> in, the chi in China, full stop, right? It's the ones who can buy condos in the West End in Vancouver and drive around in, in nice cars and so on. And the idea that there's a large suffering Chinese working class is something that's kind of, doesn't occur to, I think, most North Americans because they never see it, it's not made visible to them. Um, so this is where art comes in, this is where film comes in, literature, poetry, all of these things can be very powerful means of making visible, I think, the ways that inequality exists here and there and any solution is gonna have to happen between and not against. Um, climate policy would I, think, would I think be another great example. I think there's still a lingering cliche in the United States that China is just um, one big offender when it comes to climate policy. Even though there's been some pretty remarkable, you know, signals coming from the top level in China from Xi Jinping himself that he'd be willing to sort of take the lead on, on massive uh, multilateral action on, on um, climate mitigation. That needs to be taken seriously, right? I mean, I think that the only way that we're gonna <laughs> prevent further climate catastrophe is by, you know, states working together. And so, and casting one nation as the offender and thereby casting yourself as the hero of climate policy is, is, is always wrong. 
And um, that's one thing that I, I do have, I do have at least moderate hope that if there's a change in administration, those kind of high level multilateral interstate cooperation things, especially around climate, will hopefully, you know, immediately kick back into gear because they have to have kicked back into gear 15 years ago and they didn't. So I think those, those, those different ways of making visible collective problems that are often cast as national problems is probably the, the biggest um, task that I would see Gen Z having in front of them. Um, I think just in listening to both Professor Song and Professor Slobodian's um, answers, that sort of made me think about how I think a lot, so my background is psychology, and I think a lot about um, sort of the social aspects of psychology, and I like to think about how, so I said this at the beginning about how I really enjoy having conversations with different generations, and I really strongly believe that having, sharing personal stories is when you really learn and can really connect with people who are different, sort of echoing the importance of diversity. And I think that's something, at least I personally, I find that a lot of Gen Z are relatively open to sort of having a diverse group of friends. And hopefully we'll also will include a diverse set of thinking as well. And I think that at least in the States and with a really polarized um, nation, it's definitely hard to have conversations when you're so diametrically opposed on certain topics. And with some people I've spoken to, you can have a, you can have better dialogue despite coming from different sides of um, an issue. And I think that's something that hopefully Gen Z can sort of bring in the future is better communication when you are so diametrically opposed on certain issues. And I think that, like I, I said, again, I think that utilizing stories and personal experiences and just talking to people um, who may share the same views or may not will be really important for just Gen Z to think about and try to think of ways that you can have those conversations where you can really learn from each other as opposed to just shouting at each other trying to like really convince somebody of their opinion of your own opinion but trying to have those conversations and understanding where everyone's coming from and learning and being able to like like um professor Slobodian has said being able to understand that the issues experienced in one country you might be you might be experiencing in another and i think that that'll be something that gen z has to really think about so marisa well said you Definitely our thought leader and the Gen Z, as are the other uh, organizers. Thank you, professors. Um, hopefully, you'll come back in a year's time if we're all still here and healthy, and will the world may look completely different. And we look forward to getting your takes on it. Hopefully, uh, we'll be in a better place. But uh, it's conversations like this that really make uh, the day to day so wonderful. So. Everyone be well. Thanks for joining the Gen Z Global Forum and uh, see you next time.